Hi, everybody. Welcome to another presentation as part of Virtual Bird Bash with Gulf Coast Bird Observatory. Right now, we have Kelsey Lowe with us. She is a senior naturalist, adult programs manager, and resident ornithologist at the Houston Arboretum. Um, and the comments section, as always, is open uh, to questions. And Kelsey has told me that this is going to be kind of interactive. So if you have any questions for her, uh, do feel free to put those in the chat and we'll try to get to those. Um, so without further ado, welcome Kelsey. Thanks Celeste. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk. This is such a cool event and I love that you've been able to go virtual. Um, as Celeste said, I work at the Houston Arboretum and Nature Center. Um, you can see a photo of our meadow behind me, our little pocket prairie. And uh, I wanna focus on the plants back there for a minute, all these beautiful native sunflowers and grasses. Because even though I'm the bird person, in air quotes, at the Arboretum, um, that's my specialty. I teach bird watching, I lead bird surveys, blah, blah, blah. But the more I learn about the birds here um, in Houston, and the more I work with conservation of our wild spaces and of birds, the more I realize that plants are critical to this equation. And I think a lot of bird watchers may not be aware of how important important plants are to birds. They may seem like this beautiful green background upon which birds exist, just sort of a, a neutral space, but it is way, way deeper than that. And so even though it may seem weird that it's a bird bash presentation about plants, um, I hope you're going to see the link uh, soon after I finish my talk because without plants, birds would not exist. So that is my talk today is a bird's guide or a bird's eye view of gardening. Pop this up here. There we go. All right. So you should be able to see my screen. Celeste, are we good? Awesome. Excellent. So a bird's eye view of gardening. Um, I'm using chickadees as my focal birds because there's been a lot of work done on chickadees, but mentally insert your favorite songbird in here um, because a lot of this applies to them. But when we're talking about cons conserving birds, about ensuring that there's gonna be birds for us to watch for the next generation, you may not think about gardening as your first step. But I wanted to start with this to get you focused on why it's important. This is a quote from Michael Pollan about humans, but it applies equally to birds. You are what what you eat, eats. So not just you are what you eat, which is true, but you are what, what you eat, eats. And that is the root of the link between plants and birds because everything eats plants, ultimately. Um, even a majestic bald eagle is eating animals that have been eating plants somewhere down the food chain. So it all starts with plants. That is the whole basis of our system. And without that, the birds couldn't work. So thinking about it on a simpler terms, what would you grow in a garden if you had to live off the land? I mean, birds have to live off the land. They can't go to the supermarket and buy a can of mealworms. They have to eat what they see outside. So if you had to do the same thing, what would you grow? You would have to grow some kind of protein to support yourself, uh, either vegetable-based like soybeans or animal-based, maybe chickens. Um, you'd need vitamins and minerals. So you'd need to grow your leafy greens and your fruits and veggies. You'd probably want some starches um, for carbohydrates like potatoes or uh, even sunflower seeds and good healthy sources of fats, all the stuff that you need to live, to raise your family um, in a garden outside your house so you'd be able to get everything that you need to support yourself at any time of year. So what would you grow in a homestead garden if you were chickadee? Imagine you're a tiny bird, you weigh 10 grams, the world is huge and you need to feed yourself. What would you grow if you could grow a garden? Well, what do most people put in their gardens for birds? What do they think birds need? Usually it's something like this. Uh, maybe they'd put out suet or bird seed in a bird feeder because they see birds coming to their bird feeder for seed. Maybe you grow uh, sunflowers or coneflowers or other seed bearing plants because you know birds like seed. 
Uh, maybe you'd even grow fruits uh, because you know there's lots of birds that love fruit. Migration is just cooling down. Everybody knows you got to look at the mulberries to see all those thrushes and orioles and tanagers coming through. This is usually when you see gardening for birds, this is what the recommendations are and this is what your generic wild bird stores will tell you to grow, which is good. I'm not saying it's bad, but it's only part of the equation. To understand what a chickadee really needs, what birds really need in their gardens, you have to think about their whole life cycle. So what's missing here? Is this a good homestead garden? Does this provide enough nutrition for a chickadee family to live throughout the year? It's got lots of nice bird seed. It's got a beautiful artistic feeder. It's got some lovely seed bearing plants in the background. We'll pretend there's some nice fruiting shrubs back there as well. What's missing? Again, this is all the stuff people put in their gardens for birds. Feeders with seeds or nectar, maybe native berry shrubs, maybe birdhouses if they're feeling bold. But what do these birds actually need? They need insects. Insects, that's the part that's missing. That's the part that everyone seems to forget. I may be preaching to the choir here because you guys are actually participating in bird bash, but a lot of people forget that your backyard birds that you see coming to your seed feeders or you see coming to your nectar feeders or you see eating fruits, usually they're eating insects at least half the time. Hummingbirds, believe it or not, mostly eat insects. They eat insects in about the same proportion as they eat nectar. It varies from species to species, but they eat way more insects than you think they do. That's where they get all their protein. Um, birds of prey, like uh, eastern screech owls and Mississippi kites and kestrels, eat tons of insects. And all of your favorite backyard feeder birds, your robins and your cardinals and your chickadees, they're either eating insects regularly as part of their adult diet, or they're feeding their babies caterpillars and other insects. That is especially crucial because even birds that you see eating seeds almost exclusively as adults, they eat caterpillars when they're babies. Um, insects, especially caterpillars, have such an amazing concentration of protein and fat. It is the best way to grow a tiny baby bird super quickly. Because when you're a bird, you need to grow up very fast. Um, in order to get, get enough nutrition to grow up super fast, you need that reliable source of protein and fats. So it's insects. Insects are the basis of most of the birds that we see that live on land. Um, and that's what people forget in their gardens. So if you're only providing seed, if you're only providing fruit, if you're only providing nectar, you're only feeding the adult birds. You're not feeding the babies. And if you don't have babies, you're not gonna have birds in the next generation. So it's the insects that are the missing part of this equation. So I just wanna hammer this home until you can't stand it anymore because <laughs> it's really, really important. Um, and I don't think people realize how important it is. So I'm basing much of this talk on publications from Doug Tallamy's lab. He's a scientist who works um, in the Northeast, uh, looking at the link between native plants and birds, and especially the link between caterpillars and birds. So he had a grad student, bless their heart, sit outside chickadee nests and actually count how many caterpillars <laughs> Individually, the chickadees were feeding their babies, which would have been quite a summer project, I would imagine, but they've actually quantified it within a range. So here's my pop quiz to you. How many caterpillars does an average chickadee family need to consume just for one nesting season? This is one nest of Carolina chickadees in one season. I want you to make a mental guess as to which range of numbers you think is correct. My guess is C. All right. Celeste is guessing C, 3,000 to 5,000. You might have been able to predict that because I'm making a big deal about it. Yes, it is D. It takes 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars just for one family of chickadees for one nesting season. That's a lot of caterpillars. And I mean, these are tiny little caterpillars because imagine these chickadees are very, very small. They're gathering all these tiny caterpillars to feed their babies. These are the kind of caterpillars you don't even notice 
um, hanging out on the undersides of leaves. You would never even know they exist. But this is what chickadees rely on. Without those 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars, they're not gonna be able to raise a family. They're gonna starve. So that's a lot of caterpillars. When I learned this, when I started reading these papers, I started looking at the world completely differently because now whenever I look at plants in a garden center, instead of seeing the flowers, what I'm seeing is caterpillars. How many caterpillars does this plant support? Because I like to garden for wildlife, birds are my thing, obviously. So my tiny garden in my backyard is devoted, not exclusively, but pretty much to looking at how many insects each of my plants supports because I wanna support the birds. Um, and the more insects there are, the more birds you can support. So it's just a different way of looking at gardening. You don't have to do this. You can get real obsessive about it like me, or you can just throw in a couple caterpillar plants here and there. Um, I'm gonna give you some examples at the end, but try it once or twice. Go through your local nursery, try to figure out how many different species of caterpillars some of these plants are, and it can be kind of sobering. So here's, here's the hard numbers. Chickadees need caterpillars. I told you they need 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars for a season, but just so that you know I'm not making this up, study after study shows the more caterpillars there are, the more insects there are available in the local ecosystem, the more babies that these birds are able to produce or the faster the babies are going to grow. This particular study done in 1999 showed that the more caterpillars that the chickadees were able to catch per minute led to faster nesting, nestling growth rate. So the babies were able to grow faster, the more caterpillars there were, are around. Then when you look at the caterpillars, here's where we start focusing on plants. So what supports the caterpillars, right? We need caterpillars to feed the chickadees, but what do we feed the caterpillars? Native plants, native plants. When you look at introduced plants versus native plants, the number of caterpillars is not even comparable. There are overwhelmingly more caterpillars supported on native plants than non-native plants, especially when you're looking at trees. So this little graph is kind of weird. The number of caterpillars supported is on the y-axis that's going up and down. Woody ornamentals is a fancy way of saying trees that you plant in your backyard, um, especially for trees. The number of caterpillars supported for natives is astronomically higher than for introduced plants. We're going to talk about that right now. Why is that? When you look at a non-native plant, so let's say you got a sycamore maple from Europe for some reason. You thought it looked pretty. You plant that in your backyard in eastern North America you might be able to support about four different species of caterpillars on that sycamore maple. If you planted a native red maple, you could probably support 31 species of caterpillars. If you planted a sawtooth oak from Asia in Houston, you might get one, if you're lucky, species of caterpillar. If you planted a native white oak, you get 134. That is an unimaginable difference in the number of caterpillars. And that's because caterpillars are host specific. So everybody knows about monarchs and milkweeds. Monarch butterfly caterpillars are tied to milkweed plants. The point of this is that plants don't wanna get eaten. Plants are just like us, they don't wanna die. So they have come up with all kinds of exciting chemical defenses to keep caterpillars from eating them in the form of all these wonderful toxins, like that milky sap that's in milkweeds. Caterpillars, in order to survive, have to evolve ways of dealing with these nasty chemicals. And each group of plants has different sets of chemicals. So these caterpillars end up specializing on one or a few different host plants because they literally can't afford to try to be able to eat all the plants. They can only develop the right chemicals in their own bodies to cope with one group of plants. So then you end up with all these caterpillars that are host specific. So it's hard to find numbers, but from the best I've been able to find from papers that I can see, about 70% of caterpillars globally specialize just on one family of plants. So what does this have to do with birds? The caterpillars in Houston or anywhere 
have spent thousands and thousands and thousands of years evolving to deal with the plants in their environment. They're evolved to deal with the plants that are native to the area where they live. So Houston caterpillars can eat Houston plants. They don't know how to eat non-native plants. They either don't recognize them as food or they just don't have the right machinery in their bodies to process the defenses of those plants. So an Asian sawtooth maple in Houston is not gonna get eaten by Houston caterpillars because they don't know how to eat it. Whereas that Asian sawtooth maple in Asia, where the caterpillars have learned to live with it, would get eaten by all kinds of caterpillars. It's perfectly good in its own environment. It's an important part of their ecosystem, but it just doesn't fit in here. It would take another few thousand years for our caterpillars to start learning how to use it, which is time that we don't have. So if you wanna support the caterpillars, if you wanna support the birds, you really gotta use native plants because that's what the caterpillars are used to. And this, you can actually see this in the birds. So there's an amazing paper, I urge you to go check it out. It's by Desiree Narango and a bunch of other people from the Talamy Lab. It was published in 2018. It looked at a big swath of neighborhoods in Washington, DC, and they actually went out and quantified every single plant, whether it be in someone's backyard, on the median, in the gas station on the corner, they looked at every single plant in the neighborhood, figured out if it was native or non-native, and then looked at every single chickadee nest in the neighborhood and figured out how those chickadees did. And they found a pretty sobering result. The amount of baby chickadees produced decreased as the number of exotic plants went up. So to put it the other way, the number of chickadees that were able to fledge to produce surviving young increased with the increased percentage of native plants. The more native plants there were in the neighborhood, the more chickadees were produced. The fewer native plants in the neighborhood, the fewer chickadees were produced. And it was actually a pretty strong relationship. Um, there were a whole bunch of graphs. I didn't put them all in because it would make your eyes cross. But I urge you to go check out that paper if you're interested in the results because it's, it's worth pouring through because they found all kinds of really cool stuff that I don't have time to get into. But it is a very strong link between the survival of these chickadees and the percentage of native plants. So what, why does it matter? I've been talking about chickadees because that's what the studies have been talking about. So what if you don't care about chickadees? Maybe you hate chickadees, I don't know. Maybe one hit you in the face once and you just don't like them. What if you like all these other birds? Well, they need insects too. Um, about 96%, if I can find my numbers right, of North American land birds. So that's all the birds that live on land, the raptors, the songbirds, the blah, blah, blahs. I'm not talking about seagulls and terns and albatrosses. 96 of North American land birds eat insects at least some point in their lives. Yes, even birds of prey. Um, and I, I use the term insects rather broadly. I'm talking about all invertebrates. So that includes things like spiders. But 96% of North American land birds eat insects. So this should start kind of freaking you out because if you apply the same idea from the chickadee study to all these other birds, you suddenly realize, oh shoot, if we lose our insects, we're gonna lose all of these birds. So this is where your native plants come in. If you wanna help birds, one of the most important things you can do other than supporting wonderful conservation organizations like the Gulf Coast Bird Observatory is to plant native. Um, it's just one of the biggest impacts you can have on your local bird populations. And birds are in decline. Um, you probably know this. I assume that if you're watching this presentation, you are familiar with the big study that came out through a number of organizations, including Cornell University, published in 2019, that birds are in decline in North America um, to a pretty staggering degree. We've lost about 3 billion breeding adult birds um, since 1970. And maybe interesting to you, the birds that we're losing the most are kind of familiar everyday birds. It's not necessarily the weird, obscure, like hyper specialized ones. We're losing those too, don't get me wrong. But we're losing a lot of backyard feeder birds, blackbirds, generic sparrows, like white-throated sparrows 
are declining. Who would think? You see them everywhere here in the winter. You see them coming to your feeders, hanging out in your bushes, and they're declining. So why? What's going on? Why are we losing all of these amazing birds? Well, let's take Houston as an example. So here's a picture of Houston in 1891. It's a drawing of Buffalo Bayou. Obviously, it's artistic. They didn't have drones back then, so they couldn't have a satellite image. Um, but it's a good idea of what Houston looked like and many cities looked like back in the early days of North America. Little bits of city with lots and lots of rural outskirts, untouched natural habitat, but also I want to stress the farms that were there, of which there were lots, this was primarily a farm-based economy, were not huge and they had lots of native habitat mixed in around the edges or actually within the farms themselves. It's a very different system than we have today. Lots of green, lots of green, lots of plants, you can see here. Then here's the best satellite view I can take from today of that same place. So here's Houston along that stretch of Buffalo Bayou now. Not a whole lot of green. Um, if you zoomed way out to Houston as a whole, there would still be lots of green. I mean, Houston's a pretty green city. Um, there's big spaces like Memorial Park and the Houston Arboretum that are green. There's outlying areas that are green. There's lots of farmland around us that it's green, but it's different. It's a different kind of green. So I'm going back to this homestead garden idea. You may be thinking, Kelsey, I'm a responsible bird lover. I have a beautiful backyard garden to be friendly to birds. I have my seed feeder. I have my nectar feeder. I have some cone flowers because I know they're supposed to be good for birds. I've got beautiful bird boxes. I leave brush piles in the winter. I do all these amazing responsible things. Why am I losing birds in my backyard? Why, why, why is this not, why are all these bird fancier backyards not helping the problem? Because we have lots of awesome backyards now. It's because there aren't enough insects. We're missing the insects. You could try to fix habitat loss by creating the world's largest airplane hangar. Millions of acres of airplane hangar and try to put the birds in there and they would die. It's not the space so much, though that is part of a problem. The space is important, but it's what's in the space that the birds need. The birds need to eat. They need a place to live and they need a place to eat. If it's just a void of green, if it's a giant green soybean field, or if it's a giant green lawn, let's say your St. Augustine lawn, you could support maybe nine species of caterpillars on your St. Augustine lawn. You can support one species of caterpillar with your purple cone flower. You can support 14 species of caterpillar with your black eyed Susan, which is great. If that's all you can have space for, more power to you. But let me compare that to the Arboretum. And I know that's unfair because the Arboretum is 155 acres and we're actually explicitly designed to be wild. But just to show you the difference between a manicured backyard Houston and a savanna habitat in Houston, which a good chunk of Houston would have been. I've only selected a fraction of the plants in this view. And I've put the number of caterpillar species associated with each of these plants. 468 species of caterpillar supported by post oak. You can't compete with that. Your St. Augustine grass with its nine piddling caterpillars is not going to hold a candle to that. The native grasses, the switchgrass supports 30 species. Uh, the, uh, well, what's the other one? The goldenrod supports 112. What I'm saying is we need more native plants. We just need more native plants. The more native plants there are, the more caterpillars there are, the more insects there are, the more birds we're gonna have. So you, it helps to think about conservation starting from the ground up, starting from the plants, which are supporting the insects, which is supporting everything else. So let's take a step back for a second. I've been focusing on your backyard garden, which I encourage you to do. Um, I'm going to refocus on it in the end. You can grow the best and the birdiest 
backyard. You could put in all these caterpillar supporting plants. You could support 15 million families of chickadees. But what's happening in your backyard needs to be mirrored on a grander global scale. One of the great things that the Gulf Coast Bird Observatory does is it links us to other places. They are looking at many kinds of birds, but uh, migrants, I'm thinking especially, going back and forth between Houston, our very local where we live our lives, the greater Houston area, and uh, Central America or South America, or uh, the boreal forest in Canada, which is where a lot of those migrants are going to breed right now. It's not just our little resident backyard birds, even though we love them, we love our chickadees. It can't just be in our backyards. It has to be all over the world because what people do in other places reflects our own bird communities. Those summer tanagers that we see here in our yards in the spring and in the fall have to come from somewhere. They can't just exist in the void briefly while they're here. We can't just care about them while they're here. So we can do all this hard work to support them in Houston, but it's gonna be kind of useless if people don't do the same thing where they're spending the winter or when they're spending their breeding season. So let's look at bird gardening on a global scale. And I'm gonna use coffee as an example, selfishly because the Houston Arboretum has partnered with Cat's Coffee to create a bird friendly blend. Um, it's called the Early Bird Blend and it has a handsome summer tanager on the front, which is a bird that we see at the Arboretum in the spring and fall. Um, it's a migrant back and forth to Central America. And uh, that's where the beans are from. The coffee beans that make this blend uh, for coffee is from coffee farms in the places where summer tanagers spend the winter. And so this is bird friendly coffee. It's a very specific type of growing condition. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that as a way to connect bird gardening to a bigger, bigger picture. So I mentioned the beans from our early bird blend coffee comes from Central America. And most of your coffee comes from either equatorial or Southern hemisphere places in a coffee belt, which is, if you know your birds, where most of our migrants spend the winters. So all of the beautiful warblers and tanagers and vireos and crosbeaks and what have yous um, that are spending the winter south of us are wintering where coffee is grown. And coffee is huge. Coffee is an enormous global crop. Millions of acres of land in this crucial winter habitat for birds is devoted pretty much exclusively now to growing coffee, which if you're a bird lover should be a big concern for you because if you wanna support these birds on their winter grounds, you can't just think about what you're doing here in the spring you have to think about what people in the coffee areas are doing in the winter where your precious birds are sitting. So many, I would say most of our migrant birds pass through or stay in coffee plantations, either on migration or during winter. And this is what most of them look like. So this is a random coffee plantation in, I believe Chiapas, Mexico. It's got loads and loads of coffee bushes, which are not native. Coffee is native to Northern Africa. This is not a native species to South America or Central America or even North America, excuse me, this is in Chiapas. Um, and to maximize the yield of coffee, the farmers strip the hillsides of native vegetation, plant orderly rows of just coffee plants, and that's what you get. You get these giant monocultures of coffee, which is a non-native plant and not a whole lot else. So you can probably see where I'm going with this. This is not a very bird friendly habitat. Do you think there are a lot of native caterpillars that are produced in this environment? No, no, there are not. Um, coffee is a particularly nasty plant when it comes to being an exotic because caffeine is such a strong toxin. That's the whole reason that coffee plants have caffeine is to kill or deter the insects that are trying to eat it. We just happen to think it's really cool. Um, but yeah, so coffee is not a very friendly plant when it comes to supporting caterpillars. This, to contrast, so I'll show you one more time. 
That is a typical industrial coffee plantation. This is a bird friendly coffee plantation. I hope you can see the difference. This is also in Mexico. This is what's called shade grown or bird friendly coffee. There's a lot of different varieties of this. This is the best possible example. This is the highest standard of bird friendly coffee is shade grown. So the coffee bushes are planted in a native forest setting. They become an understory plant. The yield of coffee is reduced because they're growing in the shade. So they're not able to produce as many flowers, but you have this beautiful complex habitat that's rich with native species of plants. Even with the exotic coffee plants, you've still got a ton of natives in this mix. So there's lots and lots of caterpillars. So there's lots and lots of birds. So the same thing that applies in your garden applies to agriculture. It's exactly the same pattern, it's just on a bigger scale. And again, I hate to be the bad news person, but migrant birds are declining, not just birds as a whole. Um, we're losing 30% of our migratory bird species since 1970. And a lot of them are very familiar birds. Some of the big declines are things like Tennessee warbler, Swainson's thrush, indigo buntings, eastern kingbirds. These are birds that you see in the migration and I love them. I get really excited when I see them coming through the arboretum in the spring and they're not doing well. They are in serious decline. And one of the reasons is coffee. The coffee that you drink in the morning could be from a, an unshaded monoculture, as they say. So different kinds of coffee plantations. So hopefully you can see my cursor. Unshaded monoculture is like that big, just coffee growing in full sun, stripped down hillside. That's what most of our industrial coffee looks like. And that's not supporting the birds. When you look at studies that look at bird and butterfly populations, so bird and caterpillar populations in different kinds of coffee growth, I'm sure I don't need to spell out to you that you see the same patterns that you do with other plants. When you have very complex native species rich shade grown bird friendly coffee plantations, you see the most birds and caterpillars. When you see lesser amounts of native plants and more exotic plants, you see fewer and fewer species of butterflies and birds. And in some cases you hardly see any at all. Um, if it's a really, really heavily industrialized coffee farm. So I don't want to make you feel guilty for enjoying a cup of coffee in the morning. I, I don't drink coffee myself, so I feel a bit smug, but insert, I mean, the same thing applies to wheat or beef or any kind of agricultural product. They all share some of the blame. I'm just focusing on coffee because I can. It kind of behooves you if you're interested in supporting birds, if you're interested in conservation, to think about at least one thing you can do in your life, because otherwise it can be a bit overwhelming, but just think of one thing you can look at in your life to see what you can do to make it better for birds. So coffee is a great example. If you drink a cup of coffee every morning, check the label. Is it bird friendly? If it isn't, see if there's a bird friendly coffee option available that's local to you. There's more and more, you can order them online. A really good source of information is the Smithsonian Smithsonian Migratory Bird Institute has a really awesome list of bird friendly coffee suppliers. I'd say you should buy the Arboretum blend, but you don't have to. <laughs> There's lots to choose from. Um, just make that one change. See if you can support one bird responsible practice, one that's going to support more native plants, support more insects, support more birds. So you can do that in your backyard. And you can do that with at least one thing in your life that's on a broader, more global scale. And you'll be going a really long way to helping birds. So that was my very long preamble um, to how we can change our practices in our gardens to be more supportive of birds. Um, so we've seen the whys of why native plants are so important for birds, of why I see caterpillar numbers popping up in my head everywhere I look. 
um, and of how agricultural practices are similar to gardening on a grand scale, how that can affect bird populations um, in just the same way. So that's the why. It's important. We need our native plants, we need our caterpillars. This is the how. So if you're interested by this, if you, this strikes a chord with you, if you want to take a bird's eye view of gardening, this is what I'm going to give you advice on to how to make those changes. And this is all assuming you live in the greater Houston area. If you're interested in this and you do not live in the greater Houston area, if you're in a quite a different place in Texas or somewhere else, feel free to follow those links um, that Celeste has posted because I'm very happy to advise on how to find suitable species for your zone because there's lots of really good resources to check out. Um, but I'm particularly focusing on Houston. So back to our original question, what would you grow in a homestead garden if you're a chickadee? The first time I showed this, I talked about seeds and fruits and suet and your generic wild bird feeder stuff. Now, knowing what you know from what I've told you, what would you grow in a homestead garden if you were a chickadee? What would you have changed in your answer now knowing what you know? Uh, we would plant native plants. Native plants. So you would probably want a mix of big trees, if you can, because big trees support the most caterpillars. You would certainly plant seed and fruit producing natives because as an adult chickadee, you like seeds and fruit. Um, but mostly with a focus on caterpillars, because if you're trying to raise a little chickadee family, you know you're going to need those 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars in just the summer to feed your babies. So you're going to want to really emphasize that caterpillar production. So here's my three simple rules. If you're designing a garden to prioritize birds. Here are your three rules. Use 70% native plants, prioritize caterpillar plants, then add value with extras. I'm going to talk about what extras means. But the first two rules are the most important. Use 70% native plants and prioritize caterpillar plants. I'm going to talk about what those things mean. OK, don't freak out about this graph. It's kind of tricky to read. I'm going to talk about what it means. So this is from that chickadee paper by Desiree Narango and her group where they actually looked at the neighborhood, the number of plants, the number of chickadees produced, and they came up with this graph. So here's what it means. On the y-axis, so on the up and down, is the rate of population change. So what that means is everything above this dotted line means that the number of chickadees in the neighborhood is increasing. Everything below the dotted line means that the chickadee population is decreasing. So this dotted line is what's called replacement. It means that the same number of baby chickadees are being born as adult chickadees are dying. So the population stays the same at replacement. So that's neutral. That's just ticking over with whatever population of chickadees you happen to have. So everything above the line would be growing population. Everything below the line is declining population. Then down along the x-axis down here is the percentage of non-native plants. So how many exotics, basically, are in this system? So when you look at this line, you will see that the chickadee population can only grow. It only starts increasing in this zone, which is where there's less than 30% of non-native plant biomass. So that means when there's at least 70% native plants in a given area, the chickadee population can increase. It can produce enough babies to actually expand the population. Right at that 70% line ends up being replacement. Same number of chickadees are being born as dying. Anything below that, so if there's fewer than 70% native plants in the environment, chickadee population starts decreasing. So you start losing chickadees if you have too many exotic plants. And so when you get to 100% exotic plants, you're really in trouble. If there's no native plants at all in your environment, your chickadee population is going to crash. So that's where I get that 70% native plants number is from this graph. 
It may be different for different groups of birds. It may be different for different populations of chickadees. But since this is the only hard number I can find in the literature, this is the number I'm giving you. So I'm going to use this as my guide. So you want to use 70% native plants in your space. Now, I recognize that everybody's space is different. The Arboretum is 155 acres, so we got plenty of space. We can have giant swamp chestnut oaks that are 100 feet tall. You might not have that kind of space. If you can plant one swamp chestnut oak that can get 100 feet tall, you've pretty much planted your 70% native plants right there. The biomass of that one tree is going to be so big that you've basically done your work. Now, I do not live at the Arboretum. I work at the Arboretum. I live in a tiny townhome sandwiched between two other tiny townhomes. My garden is about the size of a very small living room, and most of it is shaded. I cannot grow a swamp chestnut oak in my tiny backyard. I don't even have space for most bushes in my backyard. You got to work with what you have. So if you have a smaller space and you cannot plant one giant swamp chestnut oak, you have to get a little more creative. So let's say you have a reasonable sized backyard. Maybe you can't plant one giant swamp chestnut oak, but maybe you can plant a few small trees like Mexican plum. Excellent example of a native. Um, small, manageable, goes well in shade or sun, can produce many valuable products for birds, including caterpillars and edible fruit. And it has flowers for pollinators. It's an awesome triple threat. Plant a bunch of those and you're good to go. If you don't have space for small trees, maybe you can plant some shrubs. Maybe you can plant some arrowwood or some beautyberry or some Turk's cap and just use more of them. The smaller the plants, the more you have to plant to get up to that 70% number. So looking at me, I don't even really have space for shrubs in my tiny yard. So I have to focus on flowers and grasses. So pretty much everything I plant in my yard has to be native if I want to get that 70% up. And I still want to grow tomatoes <laughs> for stuff. Like I still grow tomatoes. I have a jasmine. I have, you know, I have non-native plants in my backyard. But to make up that 70% number, that means pretty much everything else I plant has to be native. So that's what I've done. Even though I'm not getting nesting birds in my backyard because it's so tiny, I'm still making a difference. I'll give you an example. The big freeze happened and it had a pretty major impact on all of us, including the birds. And I know this is just one small thing. It's not going to save the world. But I have a tiny little yard. It's very covered. Very few birds ever even look at my yard. I had an orange crowned warbler during the freeze come and sit on the ground in my flower bed, picking all the frozen bugs off of my native flowers. So that one orange crown warbler did not starve to death because I had native plants in my flower bed. I know that's just one bird. That's not gonna save the global population of orange crown warblers, but it made a difference for that one bird. It's amazing to think about how big an impact you can have on your neighborhood birds just by that small effort. You plant a few native plants, you may not save the world, but you may save the life of at least a few bird families in your neighborhood. And that's something. That's an achievement. Um, so if you care about birds on an individual level, even just one native plant, if that's all you have space for in a pot on your patio, it's something. It's one thing you can do to help at least a small number of species. It's a really good start. If you can plant 70% native, I urge you to do so because that's going to make a pretty huge impact on the birds in your area. Now here's the harder part. So prioritize caterpillar plants. There's two ways to do this. There's an easy way and there's a hard way. The easy way is if you have space. <laughs> People with big backyards get the advantage here because basically if you want to prioritize caterpillar plants in your landscape, that means plant native trees. Because native trees are huge, comparatively speaking, and each one can support many, many, many caterpillar species. So if you have the space in your yard to plant trees, great. 
All you got to do is pick whatever native tree works for you. You're good to go. Any native tree, pretty much, is going to be amazing for caterpillars. I've got the top six here. Any oak, any oak, you pick a native oak, plant it, perfect. You've done the best you can do. Oaks support hundreds of species of caterpillars. Cherries, like that Mexican plum. So cherries and plums, black cherry, Mexican plum, um, the hop, or no, cherries and plums. Yeah, Mexican plum, black cherry. Those guys uh, support tons of caterpillars and they also produce fruit and they have nice flowers, really great plants. Willows, I know not everybody likes having black willow in their yard. They mess with your house foundation and they grow real quick and they die real quick, blah, blah, blah. But if you do have space, especially near water, willows are excellent. Um, if you spend a lot of time bird watching for migrants, you'll know that migrants tend to love being in black willows. Um, and that's because willow supports so many insects. That's what the birds are going for. Um, if you've got a pecan, don't forget, pecans are native. So not only can you eat the nuts and have a beautiful shade tree, but you're also supporting tons and tons of caterpillars and uh, your local squirrels and other creatures that can eat those uh, seeds. Also all the hickories. I'll put a shout out for shag bark hickory. Our conservation team loves that plant so deeply and they feel like it's criminally underutilized in landscaping. So I'm gonna put a shout out for shag bark hickory. Hard to find, but if you can find it and you're interested, go for it. They look a lot like a pecan. They produce an edible nut like a pecan and they look really cool. Um, cottonwoods, tons and tons of plants. If you've got water nearby, even better. They smell really good in the spring and summer. Excellent plant for birds. And maples. I know we don't tend to have a lot of maples in Houston, but red maples can grow really well. Um, and there's a couple of others as well that you can grow, but uh, maples are really good for caterpillars. Um, so all of these are like the best possible plants that you can have in your yard if you have the space. But as I said, not everybody has the space. I can't even plant a shrub in my yard, let alone a tree. This is where you have to start doing your homework. So this is the hard part about prioritizing caterpillar plants. So how do you know it's a good caterpillar plant? That's the tricky thing. Um, so the numbers that I have on all these pages come from a variety of sources. What I would say the best place to go for now is um, the National Wildlife Foundation, NWF Plant Finder. There's something called the NWF Plant Finder. It's not fully operational. It's a little bit wonky. They're still working on it. It's not complete. Do not take it as gospel. The numbers are very approximate. Um, and they also have slightly weird interpretations of natives. Um, their their uh, location information is based on your zip code and it's kind of right, but it's also a little bit weird. I'm being very vague. It's new and they're doing it for free. You got to cut them some slack. So unfortunately, that's the best place to get information about caterpillar plants. So take it as a rough guide. That's what I got these numbers from. Um, so if you go to the NWF plant finder, type in your zip code, click go. It'll give you a list of all the caterpillar plants in your area that they have information for. And it at least gives you a priority list. So you'll know roughly which plants support the most caterpillars. And you can kind of keep going down and down and down and down the list until you find some that work for you. That takes effort. I appreciate that that takes effort. You have to actually do that homework, write down your list of potential plants, then go to the nurseries, try to figure out which ones from your list will work. It's annoying. I wish nurseries would just put that information out there, but they don't know. They don't know that that's something that people are interested in. So talk to your nursery people. Um, anyway, this is a different conversation. But if you're like me and you have a small yard and you cannot plant a giant tree, here's a great list for you. Sort of top six small caterpillar plants. Goldenrod, oh my gosh, this thing is a bird magnet. In the fall and winter, that is where we see so many birds at the Arboretum. Not only does it have beautiful yellow flowers, and by the way, that's not the thing that gives you allergies. Goldenrod doesn't give you allergies. It's ragweed that gives you allergies. Ragweed blooms at the same time. Ragweed is a wind-pollinated plant. That's why it gives you the allergies because the pollen's blowing around. 
goldenrod is an insect pollinated plant. It's not really the one responsible for giving you the runny nose. I know because I suffer from allergies. Anyway, goldenrod. You can trim it down, make it happy for your yard. It's a really great plant. I won't stop yelling about it until people start planting it. Um, another cool thing about goldenrod is that um, certain species of insects will lay their eggs in it and make something called galls, which are these big round lumps. Birds freaking love galls. Even downy woodpeckers will go and land on these goldenrod sticks and bend them crazily, trying to get at the little bugs inside these galls. Birds love them, can't get enough of them. Goldenrod is great. Sunflowers, any kind of sunflower, native sunflower, you pick it, plant it, birds will come. Um, support lots of insects, support lots of beneficial pollinators, and they're pretty. And then the birds can eat the seeds if you leave the uh, withered flowers on over the winter. Uh, the famous example would be our goldfinches. Love the native sunflowers. Um, hibiscus, yes, we do have native hibiscus here in Houston. They are all beautiful. They all grow in slightly different conditions. There will be a native hibiscus that will fit in your yard, I guarantee it. Um, and hibiscus actually supports quite a lot of great caterpillars and almost all of them are great hummingbird plants. So it's another extra value. Um, grasses, native grasses, man, pick a native grass and plant it. I don't really care which, they're all great. A lot of people forget that grasses support caterpillars too. Like those little orange wedge shaped butterflies that flutter around um, almost like skipping from place to place. Those are called skippers. And skipper butterflies almost all use grasses as their host plant. So native grasses like switchgrass or anything in the blue stem genus, excellent choice. Also the seeds are great food for birds. Also it's great shelter, it's great nesting material. Can't go wrong with grass. Um, and I will also put a shout out for possibly my favorite native plant. I actually have it growing in my yard, coral honeysuckle. So coral honeysuckle is a beautiful native vine. Um, it grows well in sun or even partial shade, fairly heavy partial shade. Um, it has glorious orange trumpet shaped flowers. Excellent for hummingbirds, excellent for caterpillars. And it's the host plant for probably our coolest bug, which is called a hummingbird clear wing moth, which looks like a hummingbird, but it's a moth. It's really, really cool. Um, and its wings are clear, partially like a dragonfly. It's a really nifty looking bug. Um, and if you plant coral honeysuckle, you won't be planting Japanese honeysuckle, which is the devil and should not exist. Um, Japanese honeysuckle, which is the beautiful white gold, highly fragrant plant that you see everywhere, as beautiful as it is and as nice as it smells, it is a terrible invasive. It does not support our local insects and it's a nasty, nasty plant. It chokes out a lot of our other plants and the Arboretum staff all detest it with a passion because we spend so much of our time trying to pull the darn stuff out. Um, we've all developed a sort of violent reaction to honeysuckle. So don't plant Japanese honeysuckle, plant coral honeysuckle. It's much better. Then if you've planted, uh, if you've planted 70% native plants, if you've prioritized caterpillar plants, so you've made the effort to try to pick plants that are going to support more caterpillars, more insects. Once you've done that, then you can focus on all the extra stuff, which is all the stuff that people usually recommend you put in your backyard bird garden. This is not bad. I'm not saying this is bad. Doing this is fine. This is great for birds. I'm just saying this is the lowest priority stuff. So the highest priority stuff is your native plants and prioritizing those caterpillar plants. This is just the icing on the cake. So this is all the, the stuff that's gonna be feeding the adult birds. So native berries. So I talked about a lot of those plants have fruit um, or seeds. Great, if you can get a plant that supports lots of caterpillars and provides fruit or edible seeds or nectar producing flowers, excellent. Then it supports birds at both sides of their life history as adults and as babies. So remember, baby birds are mostly eating insects. So your mockingbirds and your goldfinches and your hummingbirds, even if they eat fruit, seeds, and nectar as adults, they're eating mostly bugs when they're babies. So having plants that support both is ideal. 
then having nesting spaces for birds. So your nest boxes that are well chosen, well designed and well placed. Um, all of that is uh, available online through places like the Cornell University Nest Watch has really good nest plans. Um, if you have dead or dying trees on your property, please consider leaving them up if it is safe for you to do so. That is possibly the single best source of both food and shelter for much of our native wildlife. Um, I've been watching tons and tons of woodpeckers building nests in dead and dying trees at the Arboretum. We had um, seven woodpecker nests that I saw last week, um, all in dead limbs of, of living trees. It's really fun to watch them go. Um, and then water. Water is very important. Having a bird bath, a fountain, a pond, a stream, a dish, a shallow dish of water that you change frequently, that's going to be very important for the birds. If you can have the water moving, even better. So not everyone can have a giant waterfall in their backyard, but I mean, if you can have like a little agitator or a, even fill a milk jug with water, hang it over your bird feet fountain and just like poke a tiny hole in the bottom and let it drip. And then you've made your own very DIY drip. And that drip, drip, drip of water, that's what's gonna bring the birds in because the birds don't recognize bird baths as a source of water. If your birds live in your neighborhood all the time, eventually they'll figure it out. But the migrant birds that are only seeing your yard once in a blue moon, they have no idea that your bird bath means water unless they can see it or hear it moving. Then they're like, oh, that's water. I know what that is. And they're gonna go down and check it out. So moving water is very important. Then your feeders. Your feeders are the last step. Um, all the rest is to provide the bulk of the food and shelter that birds need. Then the bird feeders are kind of that extra snack. Think of the bird feeder like 7-Eleven. All the rest of the stuff that we've been talking about, the native plants, the water, all that, that's the grocery store, the farms, the important source of the bulk of a bird's daily food. The feeders are just the snack stop on the way to somewhere else. Um, even yes, even those nectar feeders for your hummingbirds. Remember, hummingbirds eat a lot of insects and they use a lot of native plant nectar. So those nectar feeders are just a pit stop on the way to somewhere else to get better food. I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying it's just a supplement. Don't think that you're giving birds all they need by giving out seeds or nectar. That's only one little fragment of a bird's dietary needs. It's great, it brings them in close, you can see them better, it's lovely, but it's not the full picture. Okay, <laughs> so that's a long list of things that you can do. But as I'm sure you are like me, you have a limited space, you have limited time, and you have limited funds. So you're like, I would love to build a nature sanctuary backyard, but I don't have that kind of time or those kind of resources. Great, don't panic. Work on trying to get the biggest bang for your buck, for your money, for your time and for your space. I promise you there are plants that you can use that will maximize all of those benefits for a pretty reasonable budget and in a pretty compact space. I should know because I have a tiny garden and I've done this. <laughs> so here's my top selection of best bang for your buck plants that should work in most gardens. Hawthorns. So you may not know hawthorns, but hawthorns are small trees in the rose family. They're related to apples um, and pears. And they are beautiful, criminally underutilized in landscaping. They are generally pretty shade tolerant. Uh, they don't get big, so they're nice and compact. They work in most spaces. And they are excellent for caterpillars. They produce beautiful edible fruit for your birds in the fall. Um, a lot of the fruit you can actually use as a human to make jam or wine or other cooked products, which are quite tasty. They have kind of an apple-like flavor. Um, they have beautiful fragrant flowers in the spring that are visually impressive, which is important because you live in the space too and you need to enjoy the plants in your yard. But they're also really good for pollinators. And those pollinating insects are not only gonna be beneficial for the environment as a whole, but they're also gonna be feeding birds. So this is a really great bang for your buck tree. 
highly recommend hawthorns. There's tons of native species, many, many wonderful choices to select from. Sunflowers, I mentioned sunflowers before, beautiful plants, many native varieties. In fact, you may not be aware, the big garden sunflowers, like the kind of sunflowers that make the stripy sunflower seeds that you eat, that's a native plant to Houston. The giant ones that you get in the garden store are a cultivar. They've been improved and made bigger over many, many, many years, but they are a native plant. They're one of the very few big agricultural plants that are native to our region of North America. So even if you can only plant your generic garden sunflower, great, it's still a great native and you get a pretty plant. It's a win-win. Um, all of our native sunflowers are beautiful. They produce food for lots of caterpillars. They provide shelter. Some of the big ones will actually provide shelter for birds as they forage. And if you leave the flowers up over the fall and winter, the birds can come and eat the seeds. So everybody, everybody wins. Um, holly. Holly is an excellent choice. There's lots of native holly trees. Um, I will put a shout out for Yopon holly. Um, Yopon holly is probably the most common tree in the Houston area. It's just everywhere. And it's incredibly versatile in your home landscape. You can prune it into a tiny shrub. You could prune it into a teddy bear shape if you wanted to, and it's gonna live. Um, you can let it grow to be like a 20 foot tree, or you can keep it small. It'll grow in sun, it'll grow in shade, it'll grow in wet, it'll grow in dry. It's just a really fabulous tree, grows really, really well in our environment. If you make sure and get a female, so go shopping for these in the fall when the berries are on the plant, so then you'll know that you're getting a female plant, because females and males are separate. Um, or get multiples, and so you'll have males and females. And you'll get these beautiful red berries, which are gorgeous. The plants, the Yopon hollies are evergreen, so they're gonna be nice and green through the year. And the birds will love you. Lots of caterpillars supported, plenty of shelter for nesting and hiding, delicious berries for your mockingbirds to fight over, as well as all the other uh, mimid type birds, your thrashers and your catbirds. Um, oh, and bluebirds like it too. Uh, robins, all your other thrushes, everybody loves Yopon. Um, excellent choice, great for your garden, and you can prune it and to be super tiny. Um, I will put in a plug for a lesser used native holly called possum haw or uh, deciduous holly. Beautiful plant, give it a chance. If you like really unusual sort of striking color, like a real bold statement plant, if you want your yard to be the envy of your neighborhood in the winter, get yourself a deciduous holly. It's a sleeper plant. It's a beautiful, nice green holly tree for most of the year, but in the fall, it develops these beautiful, huge orange red berries, and then it loses its leaves in the winter, but it keeps the berries. So you have these gorgeous ghostly white branches with these beautiful coral red berries that stay on all winter. Absolutely stunning landscape plant. It's one of our few sources of winter color. Um, and I urge you to try it. It's a really, really nice looking plant. And no HOA in the world is going to be mad at you for planting awesome haw. Um, sometimes native plants can be a bit of a hard sell, um, especially if you're planting them in the front and you live with picky neighbors. But possum haw and yopon are both really good choices because no one's going to be mad. Virginia creeper is a harder sell. <laughs> Virginia creeper is a native vine. Um, it's related to grapes. I love this plant. I wish more people used it, but you have to use it kind of carefully or it will take over your life. Um, Virginia creeper is uh, a pretty vigorous vine. I recommend growing it on a trellis or like an arching trellis. So you can have a beautiful arch covered in Virginia creeper so that it doesn't take over the world because um, it will spread all over the place and then you'll be very sad that you planted it. But if you plant it on a trellis, something to support it, it'll stay on the trellis and it won't cover the rest of your garden or your house. The reason I like Virginia creeper is multiple fold. It supports lots of caterpillars. It's a really good shelter for birds. It's got amazing fruit in the fall. In the fall, when I'm looking for migrant birds at the Arboretum, I look for Virginia creeper. Because a lot of our fall migrants are gonna be here gobbling up those Virginia creeper berries, cuckoos, tanagers, 
vireos, all kinds of things are going to be eating those berries. And the leaves turn absolutely brilliant scarlet red in the fall. That's one of Houston's few color changing plants. Um, so people always complain about having no fall color in Houston. Plant Virginia creeper. Then you've got a beautiful color change. It's going to be lovely and you'll be supporting your birds. I've already mentioned coral honeysuckle, so I won't go through that, but highly recommend it. I've already talked about native grasses. Pick one, I don't care. They're all great. They all grow in different conditions, different heights. If you wanna know specifics, I can talk to you ad nauseum about native grass. Um, mulberry. If you're a bird person, you probably understand the benefits of mulberry. Um, mulberries are a little tricky because it's much easier to find the exotic non-native mulberries than it is to find the natives, even for the arboretum. Turns out a lot of ours are the exotic ones. Who knew? Um, but if you can find the native mulberry, they don't support as many caterpillars as some of our other trees. But if you have a small space and you really love migrant birds, if you're a really hardcore spring and fall bird watcher, man, you plant yourself a mulberry, you're going to get not only insects, and shelter for your birds, but all of those amazing migrants coming to the mulberry fruit, um, which is so important for sustaining our birds um, as they travel back and forth. And then Turk's cap, my other favorite native plant. So if none of these other plants piqued your interest, write this one down. This one, pretty much everybody loves. Um, it supports a reasonable number of caterpillars, could be better, but could be a lot worse. It doesn't get very big and you can prune it down to be quite small. It grows in sun. It loves shade. It really thrives in shade. My flower bed is full shade and my Turk's cap is blooming quite happily right now. It uh, has gorgeous red flowers for a good chunk of the summer and fall. It is an absolute hummingbird magnet. One of the absolute favorite foods for hummingbirds coming through in the fall in Houston, um, and it produces an edible fruit. So animals can eat the fruit and you can eat the fruit. It's not particularly good raw, but you can cook it down to make a nice jelly, um, or you can cook it down and make a syrup to use in cocktails, which is how I recommend you consume it. Um, anyway, it's a great plant, uh, highly recommend it, very easy to grow, and it's very easy to find in nurseries. So it's a really, really good choice. If you can't grow anything else, you can even grow a Turk's cap on a pot on your patio. If you live in an apartment, you don't have any other space. I used to live in an apartment and I grew Turk's cap in a pot on my shady patio. So you have no excuse. <laughs> Go get yourself a Turk's cap. And then the last bit, if you want to support birds in your garden, I may be preaching to the choir here because you're bird people, but just a reminder there's things that you should not, under any circumstances, use in your yards if you want it to be bird friendly. Lighting, night lighting, um, that's become a bit of a personal bugaboo of mine, is most night lighting is completely unnecessary. It's just to make you feel good about yourself. Get rid of any lights that point straight up because they're pointless. All you're doing is making it look pretty to people who are not looking at your house because it's nighttime. No one's walking around at 3 a.m. except nasty people looking in your yard. You do not need to impress them. They are not people that you need to impress and spend money and precious electricity bill trying to make them feel happy. You're going to be disorienting and distracting and disrupting all of your nocturnal residents and especially your migrants. Night lighting is terrible for migrant birds. It makes them think that your house is the moon or it makes you think that your windows are just a pass through and it will be bad times for them. It's also really bad for insects. People don't tend to care about insect welfare, but you've noticed that I've been harping on insects as being necessary for birds to survive. Think about the moths that come to your porch light, multiply that by a bunch, and then think about all the unnecessary night lights, sports field lights, high rise lights at night, all those uplighting things around your house. You are trapping disorienting and ultimately killing insects that could be feeding other things, that could be sacrificing their little mothy lives to feed a bird when instead they're just bashing themselves to death on your porch light. So turn off lights at night. It's so easy. Just turn them off. Don't put the up lighting. 
Pull your shades down at night. It'll save your electricity bills. No one else cares. Just turn off your lights. It's great. Um, don't use pesticides. I feel like that goes without saying, but you'd be surprised how many people have told me, oh, I planted milkweeds, and then I saw these bugs on them. So then I killed the bugs. And then I realized that the bugs were monarch caterpillars because <laughs> people are just so used to killing insects that they see on their plants. It's like this weird knee jerk reflex that if you see insect damage on a plant, you throw poison at it to try to kill it. You got to untrain yourself. If you see insect damage on your plants, if you see leaf chewing, if you see holes, if you see any, you know, leaf minor damage, great. That is your badge of honor. That is the gold star on your homework. That means you are doing something right. If nobody is eating your plants, you're part of the problem, is what I'm saying. If you see insect damage on your plants, that is the best thing you could possibly see as a wildlife gardener. It's really weird to talk to other gardeners and like have them point out, oh, you've got these weird round holes in your Turks cap leaves. And I'm like, yeah, that's the leaf cutter bees. It's so exciting. It's the first time I've seen them in my yard. I'm raising baby bees. This is the coolest thing ever. And they're like, they have no idea what to do with you. Um, be that person. Be the weirdo. Be the change you want to see in the world. Um, the more you talk it up to other people, yeah, they'll think you're weird at first. But eventually it normalizes things and people will start coming to you and being like, oh, you know, I saw a, a green caterpillar on my dill. You know, what is it? And you're like, oh, that's a swallowtail. It's going to turn into this beautiful butterfly. You should totally follow it when it turns into a chrysalis. And they get excited about it. And that's really cool. Um, every little bit helps. So don't use pesticides. Um, and cats. Um, cats and outdoor pets in general. Um, I know this is a polarizing thing. I love cats. I love cats. Let me throw that out there. I adore cats. The only reason I don't currently have a cat is because I have a pet bird. Um, otherwise, I would have like 15 cats. I would be that person. But cats belong inside. Cats do not belong outside unsupervised. They certainly don't belong outside at night. Um, and they certainly don't belong outside when birds are nesting. Cats are one of the biggest killers of birds. Um, it's what they do. They're supposed to hunt. That's their job. They're very good at it. It's not their fault. I do not hate cats because they eat birds. That is the purpose of a cat, is to hunt. It's, I'm not mad at the cats. I'm mad at the people that are letting the cats out and hunt the birds in nature um, where they're not supposed to be. So don't let your cat eat birds. Um, so all of this is a no. Please don't do that. Um, I know you can't control the behavior of the people around you. It's hard because we live in neighborhoods and maybe your neighbor has outdoor cats. My down, I actually just had a family move in down the street and they have an outdoor cat who I'm now seeing around the neighborhood. So I'm starting to work up the confidence to come up with that conversation to them, being like, I almost hit your cat the other day. Can you please not? Um, don't use pesticides, don't use that up lighting. If you can naturally work some of this into conversations with people, don't be mean. You know, don't say you're a bad person for doing these things. Just say, hey, there's another way to do it and it works for me, maybe it will work for you too. If you like birds, you should change your behavior. Um, but yes, um, all these things uh, would not be good if you've done all that hard work, planning your natives, adding value with extras, all that stuff. Don't wash that down the drain by making it unsafe for birds in your yards. So back to the beginning, to my original quote, you are what what you eat eats. So your chickadees, and your cardinals, and your hummingbirds, and your vireos, and your blue jays are the insects that they eat. And the insects that they eat are the native plants that they eat. So to keep the birds in our spaces, to keep the birds in your backyard, to be enjoyed forever and ever, we need to protect the native plants. Um, the native plants are the backbone of our ecosystems. They're what are keeping our birds' populations going. Um, and if you want to help birds, one of the best things you can do is plant native. Um, so I hope by the end of this talk, I have convinced you <laughs> to uh, throw out a native plant here or there. Um, I hope that you have been able to remember some of the resources I mentioned. If you're curious about any of the resources or studies or whatever that I use, please don't hesitate to drop me a line. Follow those links that Celeste posted. Um, and otherwise, I'm good to go. 
All right. Thank you, Kelsey. That was awesome. Um, anybody watching, if you have remaining questions for Kelsey, there's still some time to put those in the comments. Um, for now, um, are there any specific milkweeds that work best for monarchs? Oh, yes. Oh, I'm so glad someone asked. Um, the dumb answer is any native milkweed, um, of which there are many, but that's not particularly helpful because there's so many. Uh, here's the long answer. It actually doesn't matter so much what milkweed you use as long as it works for your space. Monarchs, when they're given a choice of milkweeds to use, it doesn't seem to bother them so much about which one. It's a question of what's going to grow in your environment. So I'll, I'll give you three examples. If you have a somewhat shady space, grow aquatic milkweed. Aquatic milkweed, it's Asclepias perennis, I think. Um, it has a beautiful white and pink flower. I grow it in my shady, horrible clay flower bed, and it grows like gangbusters. It's blooming like crazy right now. I didn't think milkweed could grow in shade, but apparently I was wrong. Um, so aquatic milkweed, I know the name sounds scary. It can grow in water. It can grow fully immersed in water. If you have a pond, great, grow aquatic milkweed. But mine is not in water. Mine is just growing in a garden, and it grows perfectly well. As long as you don't let it completely bake dry in the summer, once it's established, it's quite happy being dry. So aquatic milkweed is a really good choice if you have a shady garden. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. A good one for a sunny garden, there's lots and lots of choices. But one of the ones we see attract the most uh, monarch activity is the native butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa. It's got beautiful orange flowers. It looks a lot like the Mexican milkweed that you can buy in stores. It grows beautifully in a garden, loves the sun, thrives in drought once it's established. Monarchs love it. <coughs> Excuse me. Talking about Mexican milkweed. So I know I'm all about the natives versus exotics. If you're specifically wanting to track monarchs, the Mexican milkweed is a viable option. But, and there's a really huge but, what you need to do is make the Mexican milkweed behave like the native milkweeds. So it's just one more step of work. The native milkweeds go dormant in the winter, and then they come back in the spring. That kind of encourages the rest of the monarchs to leave. The Mexican milkweed is evergreen. It'll bloom all year if you let it. The problem with that is that our particular migrant monarch populations, because there are resident monarch populations in places where the tropical milkweed lives, they're used to that. That's fine. Here it doesn't work so much because if you have milkweeds congregating at the same few flowers all year, they pass diseases to each other and then they get all messed up and sick. You don't want that. All you got to do is cut them down. So like Thanksgiving-ish, after you've eaten your turkey, go out and cut down your tropical milkweed and then just keep it cut down until February and then let it grow back. So you can use the Mexican milkweed, just cut it down in the winter. Awesome. Yeah, well, that's a new Thanksgiving tradition we should try. <laughs> um, let's see. So uh, we have Heidi who was commenting from Georgia and it looks like she has uh, some, she appreciates the information about shade plants. So do you have any specific suggestions for shade plants for Georgia? Ooh, okay. So I'm gonna be annoying and I'm gonna kick the can back to you. What I will say is if you are looking for, cause I'm just not familiar with Georgia, I can speak very broadly for the Southeast, but if you want to tailor the plants, <clears throat> so sorry, specifically to your region, here's what you do. Go to wildflower.org, wildflower.org. That is the website for the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. It happens to be in Austin, but it is the single best source of native plant information for the entirety of North America. So what you can do is if you go to wildflower.org, click on the search for native plants, 
it'll come down with a list. You can either search for your area um, or you can search by plant conditions in your area. It has a really, really deep search tool. Kind of takes a while to figure out because there's just so much information, but you'll be able to find lists of plants that grow in your region. And you can tailor that to shade. So, so shade plants for Georgia, for pollinators or shade trees for Georgia or whatever. Um, it's a really, really amazing tool. Um, I use it constantly. So wildflower.org would be where I would find that info. Awesome. Um, are there a lot of insect species uh, or specifically caterpillar species that are struggling or going extinct because of the lack of native plants? Yes. Monarchs would be a really good example. Um, monarch, monarchs rely on milkweeds and there just aren't that many milkweeds. And I made kind of an allusion to it when I looked at the photos of Houston from the 1890s and then from today, when I talked about agriculture being different. So fields, agricultural fields take up an enormous amount of space. And back in the bad old days when it was just individual families that were farming, they literally physically couldn't farm their fields to the fullest extent. They, they just didn't have the technology, they didn't have the manpower. So there would be bits that would always be wild and milkweed thrives in those edges, different kinds of milkweed. Unfortunately, now with our amazing technological advances and in our industrial agriculture, you don't get those quote unquote waste strips anymore. And so milkweeds are really declining and that's a real problem for monarchs. But it's not just monarchs, there's lots of other insects that are declining, bees. Bees are a really good example, just bees in general. Um, everyone focuses on honeybees, which is fine because they're important, but honeybees are actually non-native. Honeybees were introduced from Europe. They're a feral domesticated animal. They're like cats. They're a feral domestic creature. Um, what we're worried about is the native bees. So like in Texas, there's about a thousand, there's probably more than that species of native bees and most of them are declining because there's just not enough amount and diversity of native plants. Because a lot of native bees need very specific plants. Like there's native bees that will only go to blueberries or they'll only go to hibiscus or they'll only go to sunflowers. And so if you don't have those plants, you won't have the bees. Um, so those are just two of probably many examples. Gotcha. Um, and last question, are there any bird friendly versions of other products besides coffee that you wanna recommend? Ooh, you know, I've always wanted to <clears throat> figure that out. Um, I explicitly wanted to look for tea since I'm a tea drinker, not a coffee drinker. And I feel like I should be including myself in this shaming you into buying bird friendly coffee thing. Um, it's not, it just hasn't been as big a deal yet. Like there hasn't been this cultural movement to switch to bird friendly insert blank. I will say there's a small movement that's very slowly growing to make bird friendly beef. It's kind of a weird thing to think about, but imagine cows grazing on a giant pasture. That pasture could either be a monoculture of invasive grasses, or it could be a patchwork of native grasses and native wildflowers that are monitored and used in a friendly way. So I know for a while the Katy Prairie Conservancy which is another group um, in the Houston area that works on conservation. They were working with some bird-friendly beef groups. I'm not sure where that project went. I feel like they kind of ran out of steam, but um, bird-friendly beef is something that's dimly on the horizon. Um, there are probably other things. What I would say is if you're looking to support bird-friendly products, generally you're looking for things that are organic Though that doesn't always mean it's good for birds because organic is a very loose definition. But you're looking for things that are either organic, very local, because the more local it is, the less it has to travel, the less energy intensive it is, and often the smaller scale the, the operation, um, or both, <laughs> organic and local, um, which would kind of be the ideal. Um, so try to go for smaller things um, and then just try to go for products, local honey would be a great example, actually. Even though local honey is kind of tailored as being friendly or for bees, what's friendly for bees is also friendly for birds. So local honey raised on a small scale 
is going to be a million times better for birds than industrial scale honey, like the squeezy plastic bear honey that you get just labeled honey with no other information. Goodness knows where that came from and how it was produced. If you want to get really responsible honey, go to your farmer's market or go to your shelves. You can actually find a lot of local honey on big grocery store shelves now. Um, and it, it does make a difference. All right. Well, I think that's it. Thank you so much, Kelsey. That was amazing. You're very um, welcome. Yeah. And like Kelsey said, there are links in the, de the description below if you want to learn more about native plants or the Arboretum or anything like that. Um, so yeah, thanks very much, Kelsey. You're welcome. Thanks, Celeste.